everyone. This is Mike Olson, Director of Development for Stand Up For Kids Orange County and the host of Listen Up, the Stand Up For Kids podcast. On today's episode, we'll be speaking with Ciamara Orozco, a program supervisor at Stand Up For Kids and a dreamer. Uh, we're going to talk to her about her life journey and what it means to be a dreamer. Uh, welcome, Ciamara. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mike. All right. So first question, what is a dreamer? Okay, so that's a really good question because there's uh, different aspects to it. So let me let me read you the exact definition. So a dreamer, it refers to an immigrant youth who qualifies for the Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act. So all those acronyms stands for DREAM. And then at the end, you know, we're just throwing dreamers. So this actually was passed um, in 2012. President Obama issued DACA, which is a component to the DREAM Act. So with DACA, it stands for Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals. So after the DREAM Act didn't pass in Congress, the young people impacted by DACA and the DREAM Act are often deferred to as dreamers. So that's where the dream, the dreamers terms comes from. Okay, and uh, can you, so DREAM is an acronym. Uh, can you tell me what the, what the D-R-E-A-M is again? Yeah, so D is for development, relief, and education for alien minors. So that's DREAM. Okay. And, and then that... DACA is Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals. Okay, and that, so uh, DACA passed in 2012. Uh, am I saying this right? So the, let's just, uh, so 2012. Okay, so in 2012, President Obama issued DACA. And that was the executive order for deferred action on childhood arrivals. And this was passed because the DREAM Act, so the Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act didn't pass because essentially the DREAM Act was going to help us gain citizenship and that didn't pass. So then they had to create DACA, which is now helping the dreamers be able to get a work permit, be able to get a driver's license and essentially seek higher education. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so in 2012, Obama wanted to do a, an, ag uh, an aggressive um, bill that he could not kind of follow through on. So he got a little bit less aggressive bill mm -hmm. um, that he could make happen. And ultimately yes. the dream term just kind of stuck, even though yeah, it that just stuck. Mm -hmm. Bill didn't. So the happen. the actual thing that dreamers have is DACA, but we just stayed with the name dreamers because that's that's who we are. Okay, and before so whatever this might be beyond your uh, whatever. Uh, what so before twenty twelve what. What did dreamers or DACA folks like? What was their status, or why was it why was it a thing that Obama needed or wanted to to pass something like that? So this happened because there were a lot of young kids like myself who we came from Mexico, from Central America. We came to the United States very young, and. We you know as we started getting older in high school, our friends started being able to drive. They started to get um, driving permits. They started to be able to get to work. So then by the time, so for example, for me, I started asking my parents, I was like, oh, like, am I able to get a job? Like, how can I apply? I want to be able to drive just like my friends. And then that's how kind of we all find out, oh, like, you actually like you can't do that there's a limit because you're not from here so you're not able to you know apply for a job or do something as simple as being able to have your own driver's license so because there were a lot of kids who were young they grew up here so all they know is california or any other place in the u.s that's all they know because that's they where they grew up there's some kids who come here when they're babies I came when I was eight years old. So this is all we know. We have very you know, little remembrance of Mexico or of the place where we came from. And this is all we know. We eventually, you know, we grow up American. So it was, there was just a lot of us who were wondering those questions. Why aren't we able to do so? And I think that brought up, that was brought up by, um, by Congress, by the White House. So they were able to 
to give us this, like I mentioned. So the DREAM Act didn't pass, unfortunately, because Obama wanted us, you know, wanted something better for us. He wanted to be able to give those young children who immigrated here, you know, eventually a, um, what would you call it? Sorry. They were, they eventually wanted to give us um, the opportunity to be able to, you know, just be the same as everyone else. And that didn't that didn't happen. So then that's why that got happened, and that has helped a lot. A lot of us dreamers be able to, you know, like I mentioned, seek higher education, and then just honestly just be normal, just like everyone else, being able to have the same opportunity, just like everyone else. Got it. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back a little bit, and um, so how did you get? So you mentioned you got here when you were eight. So what? Mm -hmm. What, why and your family came presumably T tell me a little bit about uh how you got here and why you came and things like that yeah so originally i'm from acapulco mexico and that's where i was born and raised for eight years so in acapulco it was very difficult for my parents to you know like find a stable job a good paying job in that matter my mom had me when she was very young she had me at 18 and it was very difficult you know for an 18 year old to be raising a little girl um, by herself and then with my dad as well but it was just very difficult because there's not a lot of opportunity in a place um, like Acapulco Mexico you know there are many jobs that are they're the same or if there are jobs available they don't pay very good so, you know, you had my mom taking me to work with her. She would ask um, her boss or any of her coworkers to be able to, you know, take me in because she needed to be able to provide for, for us. We were a little family and then eventually, you know, my sisters were born as well. So now we were a family of five living in a one bedroom little house in Mexico that was very small. And like I mentioned, we needed to meet um, meets ends. My parents needed to be able to provide food. They, they needed to be able to provide, you know, like uh, education for us. And that was something that was very difficult where I'm from. So my dad decided to come here to the United States. He came here first and he had a job opportunity. He came here. And then eventually me and my sisters followed after my dad came here. So my dad was here by himself for two years. And then after those two years, me and my sisters came here. And then my mom followed like a few months later. So then we were all kind of reunited at the end when we came here. And I mean, I still I still remember when we first got here, it was like, wow, like a, literally a whole new world. So I, in Mexico, we had like a very, a very small house. And then when we came here, we actually um, were able to stay with my uncle and he had a house and me and my sisters were able to have our own room when versus in Mexico, you know, it was all five of us in one room. And then we come here and was like, wow, like, you know, there's this big house, we have a backyard, a front yard, and, you know, we're able to have our own room. So it was very like, wow, like this is the American dream, you know, to be able to come here and be able to have our own personal space. It was just amazing. So then we came here around 2008 and fairly after that, unfortunately, my dad lost his job because of the um, economy. That was when the economy was really bad. So he lost his job. We unfortunately, we lost the house as well because we couldn't pay for it anymore. And it's always been difficult for my parents, you know, as immigrants to be able to have a, a good working job. My mom started cleaning houses. I would go with her um, every day that I could to clean houses. I mean, I was in school, so she wouldn't take me during the weekdays, but on Fridays or during the weekends, I would go with her just to kind of help out and clean houses. And at the beginning, you know, you think like as a little kid, as you're growing up, you're like, oh, like, why do I have to work at such a young age? But it's something that, you know, immigrant children have to do. They have to be able to help out their parents to support them and to provide just to provide that extra support because it's already hard for the, you know, for the mom and dad or just for the mom to be able to get a job, find a good paying job. And, you know, unfortunately, when it's something that's under the table, it's not it's not that great of a pay, you don't get the benefits and it's just, it gets a little bit more, more complicated. 
So then, yeah, we lost the house. And then after that, we were able to find an apartment. My dad was able to get um, like a part-time job. And with that, like we were doing okay. But then after that, we like, my dad just completely like lost his job. He wasn't able to work. My mom wasn't working at the time because my sisters, they were very young. So I came here when I was eight and my sisters came here when they were one and two. So this is for them, like this is all they know. And then, so having to take care of my sisters, taking them to school, we couldn't afford rent for any apartments. So we ended up going to a garage. It was very, very small. We didn't even have a dining room. It was just like one, it was a garage. And then it was like one little square where we had a bed and then a small table and then like a small little bathroom. So we had to move in there because that was what we could afford at the moment. And it was very hard. I mean, it was all five of us again. It was just kind of going back to Mexico, all five of us sleeping in one full size bed. We didn't have a dining room table whenever we wanted to have dinner together, you know, like we would be kind of spread out on the floor. We had to wake up very early on the weekends to be able to go get food from church or if we wanted extra clothes, you know, we couldn't go shopping at the mall. We had to go to church and look through the racks that they had at church for clothes. We had to go to Goodwill and resort to different um, resources like that. So it was that was a very difficult time for my parents. And I mean, for all of us, too, because they didn't want they didn't want their daughters to see them struggling, you know, like they came to that United States to be able to provide something better for them. And we did, we saw it for, you know, like for a year, we were good. And then unfortunately that happened. So now we were back to square one. So that was something that, you know, it was very unfortunate that happened, but I think it just really showed me. And I think I can say, it, I think for every other immigrant family as well, it just goes to show that no matter what we go through no matter you know like if we're kicked down to the ground if we lose our housing and no matter what happens to us any challenge that we face as immigrants we are hard workers and we don't let anything stop us so i think that's why also i like the term dreamers just because you know we come here with dreams and we come here to make those dreams come true so yeah cool i want to ask you a few questions about what you said mm -hmm. Uh, so t tell me just the nuts and bolts of, uh, okay, your dad, what, life is rough in Acapulco. Uh, you want to find a better, a better path. Your dad, uh, you decide to come to the U S and your dad comes. What does that look like? Does, how does he get into the U S? So that I don't really know. Cause I was really, I was really young and he actually, so when he first came here, he went to New York first um and i think he was like a, a chef or a dishwasher in some restaurant in new york he was there for about a year and then he came back to acapulco and then after that is when he came here to the u.s i'm not entirely sure how he got here because again i was very young and it was kind of out of nowhere like there's some like childhood stuff that I don't remember. So looking back at that, I think I just remember like my dad being gone for a long time. And I just asked my mom, I was like, hey, like, where's dad? And then she was like, oh, like, we're going to be with him soon. And that's kind of like all the gist that I got from when my dad came here. Because again, we really didn't know. And we didn't know if he was going to be coming back again, like what we were going to do. But then eventually, we all came here with him. Okay, so uh, do you, can you recall how you got here? And what that like um yeah. yeah so i i was very young i came with a family a family member that was already here so the people that we were staying with i came with them i don't necessarily remember like the whole like trip but i remember it was like in a car so it was like a long like road trip so so this the sixty four thousand dollar question um for me is how did you, so you're coming in as an illegal immigrant, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, and we've got border patrol that shouldn't be letting you in maybe. Uh, how'd you get in? Like, did they, they just, you just drove through? 
Um, no, we stopped like at a checkpoint, but I mean, I guess it was like back back then when it wasn't uh, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like as you know, like oh, like let me check like everyone's papers and like as strict as it is now. But I just remember, yeah, we stopped by like several checkpoints, and then we kind of I just made made my way in with the family members. And this was you were eight, so that was uh, what about the time frame? That was like two thousand five-ish something like that yeah 2004 2005 yeah yeah okay interesting um so you just came uh did you know other um what were there other people in your area that had done the same do you know anything do, do you recall anything like that no like i mentioned so like i didn't know i just thought oh like we're you know like we're here this is like a new place like this is gonna be our new home but when I, so I started school in third grade here. Yeah, I started in third grade. And then from there, like, I mean, I didn't speak English very well at the school where my parents had me in Mexico. Like they had like a little English class, but it was like basic stuff, like the ABCs and your colors and your numbers. And that was about it. <laughs> that was about all I knew for English. So when I came here in third grade, it was like a whole new the school system and just the school in general it was like wow like the school was like bigger than the house that we had over there it was just like the classrooms were super big um but with that no i didn't know anyone i mean i knew there were people that looked like me but i didn't know if they were in the same situation that i was or what really what their situation was but there were a few people who looked just like me so i was like oh like they're just like me. I didn't really think about, oh, like, did they come here like just like I did or are they immigrants? Those questions really never really like went through my head. I was just like, oh, like this is good to know, like, you know, like they look like me. So like that made me comfortable because other than that, it was like in high school. I went to high school in Irvine and then I went to elementary in Santa Ana. Definitely like, you know, like there was a, a big difference in demographics in that. So, you know, just knowing, getting here and seeing people that just look like me, that was just really comforting and nothing else really went through my mind. Uh, and uh, as a as a illegal immigrant, you were able to go to school and there was no like roadblock yep. there? Um, yeah, just... because there's public education. So anyone, as long as you know you have an address, you are able to um, get enrolled in school. They don't ask for any paperwork or anything like that. It's, free public education. Gotcha. Do you ever talk to your parents about like that, like your past and how you got here and what, like what was their mindset or thought process about coming here? Um, I remember we talked about it once, just when my sister started getting older too. Like they, they had questions too, just like I did. Like, oh, why can't I get a job? Why can't I, you know, go get my permit? So then I think eventually my parents told us, um, like just that, you know, like we wanted to come here to provide something better for you, right? Like they came looking for the American dream, just like any other immigrant does. So overall, they just told us, you know, it's a new place. We don't have our family members are all back in Mexico. Like we don't have family here, like it's just us, but you know, it's a new beginning for us, a new opportunity to be able for um, for them, hopefully, you know, like a better paying job, even if they didn't find that here, but just in general for me and my sisters, they just wanted us to be able to have a good education just because the schools aren't really that great in Mexico or if they are like, um, they're kind of like, they're mainly private schools um so you know you have to pay for them and again you the circumstances that my parents were in and then the jobs like they weren't they weren't going to be able to afford like a good education for us so you know they were like okay like here like there's public education for everyone the school systems you know they're a little bit better and um we can eventually you know pursue higher education so that's why um that's pretty much the only gist of it that they provided for for me and my sisters, it was just overall, we want to be able to provide a better future for you guys. And we want you guys to be able, you know, to have a better future. Okay. Um, got it. Uh, so what, uh, do you, are, what are, what's your parents, what do they do now? Are they working? Um, what's their, yeah. So both of my parents are working right now. Um, my dad is, 
he's with a company and like he does like um handyman stuff like he's he's always like that like and it's and it's funny because he has learned like through youtube because he can't go to school for any of this right so whenever he doesn't know anything he'll just google it it'll or like he'll like go on youtube or he'll just try it himself and if it doesn't work he'll just keep trying and trying and trying until he gets it so he's like a he's a handyman he works for a company that um that deals with like apartments so he goes and like fixes apartments and my mom is right now currently at a factory where they um where they make like t-shirts so they're both working full time because you know they have to pay for rent and my both of my sisters are in college right now so they have to, you know, be able to help them out as well, since they can't get a job at the moment. Yeah. And it's all is it being a having the status that your family has? Is that um, it's not like an education for your dad was an impediment, um, mm -hmm. like getting a job, an impediment too. Yeah, I mean, both of my parents graduated from high school in Mexico, but they didn't seek um, higher education. And when they came here, they when they would take us to school, they would go to like English classes just so that, you know, like they're here. So they have to learn the language to be able you know, to talk to my sisters to just to get around. So they did um, go to like a few classes of English. My mom mainly went through like a lot of um, the little the little classes. My dad didn't either because that wasn't his thing. But um, yeah, that's definitely a big factor. And I mean, just the fact that you know, they don't have papers, they don't have um, a social security, I guess, because that's what, you know, you need to have in order to work here. So that just puts a lot of stop into, into being able to have a career that they want. Because I remember when my dad, um, after he lost the first job, he, like I mentioned, he liked fixing things and putting things together. So eventually, you know, he wanted to get a job in that, like, be like a I guess like a legit like handyman person or like an apartment, uh, someone who takes care of apartments. Um, and there were positions like he would look like just like any other person like on Google or like on Indeed, like he would look for jobs and he would see um, that they needed, you know, they needed to have either like some type of college experience or some type of vocational or training school and he didn't have that. So that always really discouraged him. And then just the fact that if he was able to apply for a job once he got there, they asked him, you know, like, oh, like, what's like, they have to like fill in like his social security and he didn't have that. So he couldn't even finish the application just because he didn't have those requirements. Got it. Is there a fear um, for you and your family of like repercussions or like, I know, um, DACA was a hot button issue for the past few years. Um, is that, is there a, is there like an overhanging like fear? Oh yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah, every day. Um, I mean, you know, I was fortunate enough that I was able to get DACA and that it kind of, it protects me from deportation, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't protect my family. It, it only protects me. So, I mean, that's always something that's been like in the back of my head. Um, I don't remember the exact term, but Obama also passed, I think it's AB 540, or there's there's some other number at the end that allowed immigrants to be able to get um, their driver's license. So before that happened, you know, like every time we were driving, it was like, oh my gosh, like I hope there's not a cop and like they don't pull us over because my parents don't have driver's license. So, I mean, that has always been a fear, you know, and then especially like at the jobs as well, like it's kind of like, you know, sketchy working under the table. So it's just, it's always like a fear that like we've all had, like we've always been very cautious about like where we go and like who we talk to just because, you know, like we don't know. So now that um, after that passed, it was like a big relief because now, you know, my mom was able to get and my dad, they were able to get a driver's license. So now every time that we were on the road that, you know, like being like kind of like paranoid and like looking out for cops, that kind of thing, like it went away. But there's still, you know, like there's still fear every single day, like for my parents, every time like that something happens, either like on the news or just anything in general, like I give them a call, like, hey, like, don't go out or like whenever, you know, like there's for the holidays, like there's always like a lot of checkpoints. And it's like, just, you know, stay home, like, don't go out, just 
we always have to be extra cautious and just extra safe because I mean, I wouldn't want my parents to be, you know, to be deported. Like I know that there are a lot of um, other dreamers out there and just other people in general who they get separated from their families right now. You know, there's, there's kids who are separated from their families there. They have them, I'm not gonna get into it because it's very political, but you know, like they have them in cages and like they have separated from their families. They haven't been able to find their parents and you know like what kid wants to go through that whether you know like you're 25 years old like me or whether you're nine years old like you don't want to you don't ever want to be separated from your parents so that's you know it's always a fear yeah and yeah so what we're talking about is very politically charged as you've as you just mentioned um and i guess i just uh, the what your family did uh was a very rational decision for them mm -hmm. uh, to, hey, I'm in this place that does not have a high ceiling, does not have, like su success is not that likely um, mm -hmm. for me or for my family. So I have an opportunity to go to another place that the success and opportunity is much higher. Uh, so that is a rational decision that if you had an A and a B, yeah. and B is better than A, then you will choose B. Um, in choosing that, it does require that you uh, break our laws um, yeah. to, to, to uh, achieve that or to get here. Um, at the time that you came, this was less of a politically charged issue. Mm -hmm. And so as far as like, it was, it was much more casual um, to come into our country, um, I think. I think that's a safe way to say it. Uh, and recently in the last, whatever, 10 years, something like that, it's gotten much more politically brought to the, the forefront and there's a lot of animosity and whatever. Um, yeah. You know, send them back. Uh, whatever all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. like that happening uh but the i don't know uh there's a lot of people just like you and your family that are in the u.s a lot of them yeah. in Southern california um a lot of them that do a lot of good things for our country mm -hmm. um so yeah it's a sticky it's a sticky issue uh so any any thoughts or anything that you would want to add to what I said? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I totally know, like, now, the, like, you know, as, like, one gets older, like, you know, like, oh, my parents did something bad. It's, it, you know, obviously, like, it was something illegal. But, like, like, I mean, so as kids, we, you know, we didn't know. We just do what our parents tell us. So we came here. And that's why the whole, like, DACA movement was only geared for um for kids so if you were here I think it was before if you were here before 2015 and you were I think the highest age is 15 so as long as you know you came here before 2015 and you came here um before you were uh, 15 so 15 was the age limit like you were able to apply for DACA so you know that's why kind of like I was like okay and they didn't give that obviously to our parents you know we know they again like I mentioned like I know it's something illegal that they did but as children you know like we didn't know like I mentioned we always just listened to our parents so that's why I think you know we were given this opportunity because we didn't know any better we didn't know we were breaking the rules and I mean like I and my parents I know they they knew they were breaking the rules but they did it for us like they don't they didn't just do it you know like oh I'm just gonna go and see how it goes no they did it because there's a need so for every person I think that comes here they don't just do it because oh you know like I'm bored of my hometown and I want to go to a new place so let me see what's in California you know like no they do it because there's no resources over there there's no um there's no opportunities really whether it's um for jobs or for to pursue higher education all the resources are very limited unfortunately also the government it's pretty corrupt so like in Mexico you always like see news of you know like the president or just in general, like there's like the, the whole political aspect is just like a very corrupt as well. 
there's also a lot of, I mean, and there's some here too, but I think it's pretty, um, it's more strongly in Mexico, like cartels, like you can see more of that action like in there. And I know, especially like right now, whenever we talk with like my grandma, she mentions that, you know, it's like a little bit, it's harder now just to be able to like go, like go outside because, you know, like there's a lot of like the drug cartels are starting to take over or they're just a lot of um, like gang activity and just violence in general. And I mean, here we do see that as well, but it's not as, you know, it's not as strong over there. Like in Mexico, it's kind of like R rated situations. And then like here it's, it's honestly, it's, it's not like that. I mean, we like uh, us personally, we did experience um, like a gang situation uh, where in one of the apartments where we lived, but it's, it was honestly not really, it's not comparable to situations that happen in Mexico. So yeah, I, I sorry, I forgot what your, your main question was. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, do you, do you or your parents or your um, sisters, do you guys have a path to citizenship? You know, so at the moment we don't. So how VACA works is you know, we have to apply, right, for the first time. So when we first apply for DACA, we have to go through an extensive process. We have to fill out like a packet that's like this thick for the first time, you know, putting in all of information. We have to send all of the addresses where we've lived before. We have to send school transcript, middle school, elementary, high school, and if we're in college, we have to send all of that as well. We have to go through, um, through a background check as well. And we have to pay like $500 for the first time to be able to get um, get a work permit and be able to have VACA. It doesn't go through right away, of course, like I mentioned, you know, we have to put in everything, how we got here, all of our information, and then we have to send them a copy of like an ID or some sort so that they know like what we look like and who we are. And then that takes like, I remember it takes like a month it's from a month to three months in order for them to get your paperwork and go through it. And then after that, they send you another notification of, okay, like, you know, like you, you're passed, like you're good to go. We don't see any criminal background. Like it looks like, you know, like you're clean, you're okay. And then they give you an appointment to go do your fingerprints. So you have to go and like into your fingerprints. Um, so that way, you know, like you're in the system and then after that, they send you um, a work permit and then they send you your social security card. So with that, you know, a work permit, you're able to get a job. So now I'm able to get a job just like everyone else. I'm going to be able to earn money for myself and to be able to help my parents. And also we are able to get a driver's license. So if we didn't have that, like I wouldn't be able to, you know, be working or being able just in general to drive because that's something that provides, um, that DACA provides us with is the work permit and being able to be able to get a driver's license. And then other than that, I think, well, for me, the sucky thing is that we have to renew that. Before Trump, we have to renew it every two years. And that goes along with the driver's license as well. Like whatever date your work permit has, that's the same date that your driver's license is gonna have when you go to the DMV. So before Trump, we were able to, you know, renew it every two years. And it wasn't, I guess, like as bad as now, because now we have to do it every year. So it was, you know, we were paying, and every year the price goes up. So the starting price when you first apply, it's $500. And then after that, each year that you apply, the price increases. I, so I have to renew my work permit this year. And the last time that I paid for it, I think it was around like 550. So, you know, like slowly but surely the price goes up and it just kind of, it honestly, it sucks, you know, to have to pay like around $600 every year now to be able to just do something as simple as working and receiving higher education and driving. And the other thing that DACA helps with too is when we apply for DACA and if we want to pursue higher education, we want to go to a university, that um, when we apply for that and when we're applying for college, we can apply for a status that's called AB 540 and with that status, we are able to get financial help because at college, right, you only have FAFSA. And if you are not from here, if you're not um, a legal citizen, you can apply for, for FAFSA. So then that means you don't have help for college, right? And so 
with that, we are able to apply for a Cal grant, which then helps us to receive financial aid. So it's kind of like a side thing from FAFSA, but for AB 540 students, which are dreamers. Gotcha. Uh, for for the permit for the work permit and the driver's license, is there is there like an is, is that that will go on into perpetuity forever for you? If if the laws stay the same, you'll be able to continue to do that into adulthood and all the way through. Correct. Yeah. But if that but does ever, yeah. If that yeah, ever but gets, hopefully, yeah. If it ever gets revoked, then your access to a driver's license and a work permit goes away, and now you're in a pinch. Mm hmm. Yep. So it was very scary, like a, a few months ago, like uh, Trump wanted to get rid of that guy. And that, you know, that affects not only me, but like thousands, Yeah, I want to say even like millions of people, like we're all, you know, we're all here to, like I mentioned, to do better, to better ourselves. Like we're not just here to steal jobs or to commit crimes. We come here, you know, like with the dream, we want to be able to, to do better for ourselves. We want to, in general, just to have the same opportunity as everyone else. If that, if that guy was taken away, I would, you know, like I wouldn't have been able to finish my school and get my bachelor's degree. My sisters wouldn't be able to have the same opportunity as I did. I wouldn't be able to get a job, you know, like by having a job, I'm also, you know, I'm paying for taxes, I'm contributing to the economy, to society. So it's just like, it would really just affect thousands of people. We're all, you know, we're uh, DACA people, dreamers, we're all students. We are full-time workers. We're doctors, you know, we're lawyers. We are in the front lines right now with COVID, you know, helping out. So we contribute a lot to society. So if that was taking away, I think it would have a big impact on society and things just wouldn't, wouldn't be the same. It would like kind of, there will be like an unbalance. Yeah, and I think a lot of people just don't don't understand the magnitude of your category's impact. Uh, I mean, illegal Im immigrants as well, mm -hmm. but especially specifically DACA and how much how much work you guys do do and how much you do input into society uh, and having an official <clears throat> status uh, does does you know, gives you uh, a way to pay taxes and mm -hmm. contribute financially to our country as well. Um, okay, so let's talk about, uh, so let's, let's, uh, we're going to go back to the biography f phase of the uh, discussion. Uh, and so let's quickly, quickly tell folks how you went from a garage to working at Stand Up For Kids. Yeah. So, um, so when we were in the garage, I think I was, I was in high school. Yeah, I was in high school. I think I was a junior. We were there for two years. So my junior year and my senior year, I was there. I was um, going to school in Irvine. So I had to take the bus from Santa Ana to Irvine. We didn't have a car. I mean, we couldn't afford housing, so we couldn't afford to have a car. So the commute was like very, wow. And then from there, uh, um, after high school, I remember when it was my senior year and I was in AVID. So AVID is a class that helps you um, apply for college and, you know, like they kind of help you just pursue higher education. So when it was the end of high school, we were starting, you know, like all to like apply for college and apply for FAFSA. And I, and I had a friend too. So it was just like me and one other friend who we knew, like we were, we weren't going to be able to apply for FESFA. So we were kind of like, oh, like, what are we going to do? If we do get into this college, we're not going to be able to afford it. Like, it's just crazy expensive. So I think that was like a very, very discouraging um, aspect. And why I'm also very like thankful that we have, uh, that we have DACA because of that, like I mentioned, we wouldn't be able to go to college. So then I ended up going to community college. And from that, I, in around that same time, I was applying for DACA as well. So then I got my, my DACA, I got my work permit, and then I was able to get a driver's license. So I was going to school full time, and then I started working as well. And I was in community college for, I think it was four years, just because 
education was never really like my my strong suit. I mean, English is my second language, you know, like so it's like and when you sometimes when you translate stuff like it's it's not entirely the same. But and that was always something also very discouraging. Like for my English classes, I remember like I always had like a hard time. I was always in English second language classes just because, you know, it's something very like difficult that you adapt to. And then like at home, I only speak Spanish. So and like, you know, my mom tried, like I mentioned, like she would go to um, classes to learn English, but we just had conversations in Spanish all the time at home. So the only place where I practice English was at school. So, you know, that didn't that didn't really help. But um, but yeah, so I was in co in community college for four years, and then I was finally able to transfer to Cal State Fullerton. And at Cal State Fullerton, I major in child development, so I had to do different internships. And in those internships, uh, for one of them, I went to a school, to an elementary school, because my dream job was to become a teacher, right? And the reason why I wanted to become a teacher was because the first teacher that I ever had here, she really went out of her way to help me like with my English and my mom as well. I remember she would invite us to stay after school and she would like practice with me. And then my mom, so she was like, oh, like bring your mom and like she can practice too. So I was like, wow, you know, here's this person who doesn't completely know me, but she's willing to go out of her way to be able to help me because I'm her student. So that always like really like stuck with me. And I was like, wow, you know, like this teacher made a difference in my life. So I want to, you know, be able to do that. And I thought that I would be doing that by being a teacher. So my first internship, I went to an elementary school and I honestly, I didn't like it. All the teacher had me doing was just grading papers and kind of just sitting in the back of the classroom. So then when I did my second internship, I did it at um, a community center that was connected to Cal State Fullerton. And there I was able to connect more with the kids as well, because it was Center for Healthy Neighborhoods and they help low income families around that area. And it was mainly Hispanic low income families. So, you know, I felt at home. So there, um, the first internship that I did, I was a tutor to different kids, different age groups. And then eventually I stuck around as a volunteer and I stayed to help the supervisor at that center. So sometimes I would cover for them like at the front desk or just I would help them out with like different stuff. And I was like, oh, I like this because I was not only able to connect with the students, but also with the families. And, you know, it was just very rewarding when the kids would come back and say, like, thank you, or they, you know, they write you, like, little, like, oh, thank you so much for helping me, or when you had a mom come and, like, tell you, like, hey, you know, like, my kid is doing better now in school because you're helping them out, so I was like, wow, you know, like, I think this is the kind of setting where I would be able to make a difference in someone's lives just because I'm able to have more of a one on one interaction with the student and the family as well versus a teacher. Like we know teachers, you know, they're super inundated. Sometimes it's really hard to provide students with that one on one um, attention. But with this, like in that kind of setting in a community center, like you are able to provide that one on one attention, which is something that I like. So then from there, I worked in a Montessori school. So I was there for about six years. I work with infant and toddlers and it wasn't my thing either. I was like, I don't know. I think these kids are way too, way too small. Like I want to be able to, you know, like have interactions with them. And it was just something that I honestly like didn't like. So then I stopped working and it was my last year of, um, of school. So then I took kind of like a break because I was always working like throughout like community college and school, like I was always working. So I decided to take a break and just really focus on school. And then I was like, OK, my time is up, you know, like I have to get back to working because I have to be able to help out my parents and just, you know, like start earning money. Um, so then I went online and then I found Stand Up For Kids. I had never heard of Stand Up For Kids before until I looked it up on Indeed. And I was like, oh, like, this is interesting, you know, like helping, um, helping in the cycle of youth homelessness. And I was like, oh, like, I never like thought about it. I was like, there's kids like who are homeless. And I was like, okay, like, maybe, you know, like, this is something that like, I'm interested in, because, you know, there's, it's someone you need. And I want to be able to help out that person. 
So I applied and then like as I started, you know, like to get more involved and to learn more, I now that I'm a supervisor for the preventive program, so I work with the 12 to 18 year olds and there's a term for them, which is McKinney Vento students. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I was a McKinney Vento student. Like I didn't even know, you know, like I didn't even know any like of these new terms. So then as I started, you know, learning more here and then I started working with the kids, I was like, this is like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Like I mentioned, I was a McKinney Vento student and I didn't know that. And I'm just working with the kids, the, I'm able to relate to them as well. Like some of their families are also, you know, they come from immigrant families as well, but they were born here, but their parents weren't, um, weren't born here. So I can relate to them. And I think it's just, um, I, I've always wanted to be able to help kids in general and make a, like I mentioned, like make a difference just like that teacher did. And I think this was just like, a great opportunity and it was like wow it's like ding it was like perfect because you know there's kids in need and families also in need who are out there who don't have advocates and you know stand up for kids is an advocate for those students for those mckinney Vento students and for those homeless youth so i was like this is you know this is perfect i'm able to make a difference here and overall that's what i want to do so it was the perfect match <laughs> yeah and it, uh so I guess thinking back on your own personal journey and like, could you have used stand up for kids when you were in that age range? Would that have oh, yeah, like definitely? That yeah, because uh, I wasn't really involved in um, like in school. I didn't play any sports. I never really joined like any after school clubs or anything like that. I don't know why. But I just, it was just something, you know, like my mom didn't know that I was supposed to get involved in school. She learned that as my sisters like started getting older because my sisters ended up doing sports and like being more involved in school. But with me, like I never really had that after school studying and then my parents had to work. So it's not like, you know, like they could drive me to go to like a sport or like to a club. Like I didn't have that. So I think, you know, just having a place like this, like I wish I could have had the Anaheim Center, you know, like to be able to come in and sit down and have my own table to do my homework just because I didn't have that growing up either. Just like many of our kids, you know, they don't have that as well. They have to be sharing a bedroom with their siblings and with other family members. So they don't have their own private space. So I would have loved just to have, to have a place to go to, to just be able to do my homework or, you know, get away from problems at home. And I think that's, it's a, I think it's a great thing that Stand Up For Kids does. And I mean, right now we're in a pandemic when we're not able to see our kids in person, but we're able to still provide them and serve them virtually. And I think that's also just something very important. And especially right now where kids don't have that connection with their peers anymore. And, you know, like they're bored, like, what are they gonna do? So I'm like, they're just over, you know, being like on school, like all the time. And, and, and I get it, like, it's hard. And especially like, I know for me, like I mentioned, school was really hard. So I think I would have had a difficult time just being virtual as well. And I did my last semester of college virtually and I did not like that. So I can only imagine, you know, like, and then a uh, sixth grader or a 12th grader right now, you know, like doing online schooling and it's just, it's just really difficult. So I'm just, you know, glad that I was able to find and be able to work for, um, for Stand Up For Kids, just because we provide so many great services for kids that, that need them. Like I mentioned, you know, I'm pretty sure I, I'm not the only person who didn't know like about Stand Up For Kids. There are still many people who probably don't know about Stand Up For Kids. And once, you know, they Google who we are, they go to our homepage, it's like, oh, I didn't know there was this need, you know, for us to be here. So it's just, it was just like, yeah, it's just really great to be able to have this, to have this opportunity for our kids. We're able, you know, to provide tutors for them. They get that one-on-one -on -one attention from their tutors, as well as their mentors and I think any, I would have loved to have my own mentor to help me, you know, like, okay, like, help me apply for college, like, how do I apply for FAFSA, or like, you know, like, just like little things like that, like, oh, like, what do I have to do to go, like, get a driver's license, like, I have to take a test, like, I don't know that, so just someone to walk me through, you know, like, all those little, the little steps, I think that would have been um, very, very helpful. Uh, where, where does CMR go from here? 
So you, it sounds like you're in a really good spot. You're in, in your sweet spot. You're getting to help kids. You're getting to help kids that were like you growing up, mm -hmm. getting to kind of make the community a better place for those people that are, uh, got dealt a, a tougher hand than others. Mm -hmm. Um, have you thought about, uh, I don't know, what do you, what, where, where are you going to be in 10 years? That's a very good question. Well, very hard question. I, yeah, um, I think now my dream is to be able to have like my own center. So I want to be able to have, you know, like my own space and support those low income families. I don't care what background they're from, what ethnicity they're from, but just if they need the help, I want to be able to have a place where those families can come to and, you know, get the help that they need. So there are many, you know, resources out there. So I, I, I would like to eventually, you know, like have my own center. I don't know if it would have my name on it or not, but that's something that I would, that I want to, um, to have, like I aspire to have my own, my own center where I can provide services to those who need them. Yeah. And it could be, could be standard for kids. Standard for kids is definitely trying to do that too. So uh, you have a convergent path uh with us yeah. so we we hope you stick around for a long time uh, last question for you uh what would you want to leave a listener uh who is um getting educated on dreamers uh what would you like to leave them with about what it means to be a dreamer I think I would want to leave everyone with, and I think not just not just for dreamers, but I think just everyone overall, and then maybe I'll get into the dreamer answer, but just, you know, we're all human beings. I think we should all treat each other with kind respect. It doesn't matter what we look like, what color we are, just in general, like how we look like, we should all treat each other with respect. You don't know what another person is going through. So, you know, just be kind to them. Like if you're having a bad day, like, you know, that's fine. Like everyone goes through bad dates, but just don't judge someone just on the way that they look, you know, just try to be kind to everyone and just dreamers. It's, it, I think it's in the name, you know, we are people who are here with a dream, and we work very hard for that dream. We're not just here to come steal jobs and commit crimes and do illegal activities. No, we come here with a purpose and we work very hard. We take certain steps, you know, there's no shortcuts for us. If anything, there's extra steps for us. So we come here, we follow every single step, we follow all the rules. And overall, we just want to be able to have the same opportunity as Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks to you, Mara. Thank you for listening today to Listen Up, the Stand Up for Kids podcast. A big thank you to Gabby Villarreal and Billy Huynh for their production and editing support. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Click here to watch more. Please also consider a donation to help getting kids off the streets using the link below. 92 cents out of every dollar donated goes directly to supporting these kids. I'm your host, Michael Olson, Director of Development at Stand Up for Kids Orange County. Thanks for listening and have a great day.